Eve Berkeley. So we have half an hour. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone, again. Uh, I'll talk to you about the effectiveness of sterilized foreign exchange intervention policy under imperfect financial markets. Thank you. And from now on, I'll just say FXI, and let's hope you all think that it's sterilized FXI. And I'll tell you what I'm specifically referring to. And in this context, I'm thinking of FXI as like foreign reserves in the sale or purchases. Um, and there's an in indirect consequence, perhaps you might like remember from your macro class perhaps, that this does lead to a change in the money supply. So if you were to sell, for example, your dollar reserves in the central bank, this can lead to a decrease in the money supply and can have implications for interest rates. So if we want to understand how effective FX size can be, here I'm going to try to control for that aspect and refer to sterilized FXI. And I'm going to refer to, um, I'm go focusing on sterilized FXI because we're also going to think about financial imperfections and especially about kind of a similar model we just talked about. Um, and so we might be able to understand how the sterilization can affect the composition of assets that the banks hold. And I mean, of course, UIP comes into a big play here, and we know the UIP doesn't hold, so this can lead to some deviations from divine coincidence. And so we might be able to say something about welfare implications of FXI. Okay, and I'll refer to mu star as deviations from UIP. Okay, and in terms of my motivation, uh, we know that there are deviations from UIP, and we know that these are counter-cyclical for emerging markets, so that is, they increase when the U.S. monetary policy is tight. Um, and there are only two citations, but it's a large literature. Okay, and there's a much larger literature, maybe only three papers here, but um, that try to explain movements in the exchange rate through like financial imperfections how, and how these can lead to deviations in the UIP. Uh, and in terms of the model I'll use, this will be very like similar to the paper by Akunja and Coralto. So this will be kind of similar to what we just saw before, but perhaps a little different. Okay, and there's a big literature about global financial cycles and how U.S. monetary policy can have uh, amplifying effects, especially on emerging markets. And this is uh, some of my own research with Akunja and Gianluca as well. All right. And, of course, perhaps the best motivation is the use of sterilized FXI. And um, there's an empirical literature that focuses on when sterilized FXI is used and among which countries. And, for example, this paper here is going to refer to around 33 emerging markets um, that use sterilized FXI. So that will be probably the biggest motivation to focus on sterilized FXI. So the way I see this is that there is this kind of dilemma that we're trying to could have closed the gap in, and the other papers from today were referring to this as well, where the theory doesn't, or perhaps until recently, didn't give us much room to think about if these policies could be effective. And one of the papers from a while ago is from Bacchus and Kehoe, where they really focused on sterilized FXI to see if such an intervention could be effective. So, and of course, the implications from Gali Monicelli would also hold in many other papers where we should really focus on domestic variables. Right? But in practice, we see this as commonplace, so why is that? And what are these policymakers thinking? Are they onto something? And is there some effectiveness here for these kinds of policies? And also, I'll try to answer effective for what. Okay. All right, so what do I do? Um, I try to understand if sterilized FXI can be an effective policy for controlling domestic prices or domestic volatility. Well, one thing I'll consider, as in the previous paper as well, is the dollar dependency on emerging markets and this counter-cyclical UIP premium. And some of the, I mean, I'll use a two-country model. I'll try to understand what are the costs of this kind of policy, okay? And what are possible spillbacks to the United States as well. All right. And the model is going to be, like, as simple as I can make it. So we'll have a two-country asymmetric model with some financial frictions and additionally a sterilized FXI policy, and I'll detail out what that looks like as well. And just like in the previous paper as well, um, the emerging market banks are going to borrow from domestic and foreign households, so there's going to be dollar-denominated debt as well. 
Um, and just to briefly summarize my findings, um, I look at I look at sterilized FXI relative to the counterfactual of no such intervention, and I find positive welfare gains and reduced macroeconomic volatility from this policy. And I'll explain some of the other results maybe later on with the um, impulse responses. And the new, neutral change perhaps is kind of. Um, holistic in the sense that I do find no change in prices, which echoes results from other papers. So maybe this is some sense of grounding uh, with existing literature. Okay, and on the negative side, of course, there is a risk of the country running out of foreign reserves. And in the sense of the model, you'll see that there is no recovery in reserves. And if you are hit by a similar shock constantly, this can eat up your reserves. And unfortunately, I can't speak to this at the moment, but this is just something to keep in mind. And I'll also show you that in terms of net exports and initial um, currency depreciation of the economy, some of these channels are heightened because of sterilization. Okay, and I do find some spillback into the US, perhaps this is a bit more um, different than other work, and I do find that there's a deeper in the, in recession in the US because of this kind of intervention and some welfare losses. All right, so the overview of the model, I'll have two countries and I'll refer to the home country as an emerging market because my home is an emerging market and the foreign economy will be the US. Um, and in the home country, we'll have households that will look very standard and capital producers as well that will borrow capital like, or get funding to produce capital from private banks in emerging markets and we'll have a standard, a standard with an augmented intervention policy central bank. And in foreign, like foreign country, it's very similar in some sense, and the only difference is that there's complete markets. So the idea here is I want to keep the model as simple as possible, and the idea is that there are much more financial, financial frictions in the emerging markets relative to the US. So that's why I keep the US market fully complete. Okay. And just some details about the model that I won't go over here for the sake of time, but of course there's trade in goods and financial flows and prices are sticky in the New Keynesian model. And I'll introduce these two kinds of frictions um, that are very similar to Okunjo and Coralto, where there's a default risk of an emerging market bank and that there's cross-border institutional frictions in the sense that debt from overseas can be harder to enforce. So if you were an investor from Iceland and you invest in South African economy, maybe you're more worried about getting your money back. So that's what's gonna capture. Okay, and of course there's gonna be FXI. All right, um, so I'll explain the, what this emerging market central bank looks like um, with three equations. And perhaps the first one is, the first one is probably has there more room to improve. So this is how I try to depict the, how the reserves accumulate in the central bank. I think there's much research to be done in terms of understanding how this actually works and it's not very transparent. So what I try to do is abstract as much as possible and say that the reserve, dollar reserves today are a function of dollar reserves yesterday, so there's some inertia there, and they're inversely related for the emerging market currency. So in the sense, this is what's trying to capture with some of the emerging market responses to a currency depreciation. When their currency depreciates, they try to sell off their dollar reserves and offset this depreciation. Okay? All right, and in terms of sterilization, which is the key additional component of this kind of intervention, here I'm just writing, this is pretty much the textbook definition of sterilization, it's just saying that the change is in dollar reserves that's held by the central bank is going to be equal to the amount of sterilized bonds that they're going to issue or withdraw from the market. So this is something that the central bank has full authority over. So this is, you can think of a choice variable for the central bank. All right. Um, so SB here is going to denote uh, the amount of sterilized bonds at time T and the, our dollar is dollar reserves. Okay. All right. Uh, in terms of Taylor rule, things are very similar. I'm just keeping a producer price targeting Taylor rule. Um, and again, with some inertia as well. All right. So the most interesting part of this paper and how sterilization came, comes into play is through private banks. So I'll explain the balance sheet, what it looks like, and that will give you a very good sense of what these banks do. So the banks can have three sources of funding. So they can get deposits from the domestic economy. So that would be like DT, 
and they can get deposits from overseas in the unit of the dollar, for example. So they'll have to convert that into local currency with the exchange rate. So I'm writing this in real terms, so the Q will be the real exchange rate. Okay, and then they, the bank has some net worth, and that's going to be their third source of funding. And in terms of um, the left-hand side, we'll have the bank's purchases of capital. So this is how they fund um, capital producers, and Q is here, just Tobin's Q. And then, of course, there's the additional component of sterilized bonds. And this is, I think, where the sterilization becomes interesting, is that when we have changes in sterilization, we're also changing the asset composition of the banks. Okay? And I'll talk more about how that comes into play. Uh, in terms of budget constraint, this is very kind of flows naturally from uh, the balance sheet of the bank, so I'll skip that part um, and really talk about the agency friction. Um, so again, this is extremely similar to the previous presentation, but in a simpler way without getting into this quadratic form, what the bank, I think the bank has two choices. Either they can you know, um, operate honestly and commit to their deposit obligations, or they can divert the funds and they get a certain share of their deposits, their total deposits if they do so. And this friction is captured by the first parameter, gamma. And the additional component is that these, if they were to divert, they get a larger share of foreign debt, right? So this means that loans are harder to enforce within borders across borders and within, okay? And in some sense, this is like similar to previous work, but here I just write a linear form so it's easier to understand, okay? And so we can write a similar net worth equation as some of Akinja and Coralto's work, and of course the bank has some incentive compatibility constraint that I hope, assume that binds so we can have um, some nice solutions, of course, but of course I'll, uh, this actually looks I think almost the exact same equation um, as before, which is just telling us, actually it's just telling us the same thing, is that um, banks' choice of how much they want to divert or how much they would be willing to divert is going to be related to how much foreign debt they have and how much foreign debt they have in domestic currency. Okay, so that's being captured by this variable XT. Okay, so again, we see the sterilized bonds come into play because this is a share of total assets. So if we have a change in sterilized bonds, this changes, of course, the asset composition, but it might also affect um, the total debt, the foreign debt to total assets. Okay. All right, so in a simple way, we can write two, credit, like two spreads. One is the credit um, spread in mu, and one is the UIP spread in mu star. And so if UIP were to hold, we would assume that mu star would just be zero. So with the optimal solution of the bank, we find a simple equation for what derives the UIP premium. So this is going to be directly influenced by the credit spread mu, as well as, so what the ugly expression in the parentheses is just an increase in function in X. So if um, the bank has a lot of foreign funds, they're more likely to divert. So foreign investors are going to ask a higher premium to be willing to invest in the bank. Okay, and there's a third component here, which is YT, and this comes, direct, it's a novel term that's coming exactly from the sterilization. So if you were to have no sterilization, the YT term would be equal to one. So there'd be no asset choice in capital, okay? But because we have the sterilized bond, the banks, how much the bank is transferring the spread from credit spreads to the UIP spread is a function of how much assets they have in credit to the capital producers. So if we were to change the amount of sterilized bonds in the economy, we directly change this function y, no matter what the bank does. All right, so this can directly affect the UIP's premium. Okay. And I'll show you how like, this will appear in the results as well. All right, so the two things to keep in mind are, of course, the credit spread, but that's maybe not so novel, um, and the real novelty of the sterilized like FXI is going to be coming from this term YT. Okay, so, well, just a little bit algebra perhaps, but YT, you know, if there is no sterilized FXI would be equal to one, and if there is some sterilized intervention is less than one. So you might say that, oh, there's some sterilized intervention and I might face lower UIP premium. Okay, and of course the foreign debt ratio is also going to change with the amount of sterilization. <clears throat> 
And just to close the model, we have like a very standard market clearing. And the second term is just saying any capital produced is coming from how much the banks choose to finance capital. Uh, and then the third term is the balance of payments. So this is where we see the amount of foreign reserve, like changes in the foreign reserve appear. So if you are to have an unsterilized intervention, the only effect that the intervention would come into play would be through the balance of payments. And you wouldn't have any of the effects coming from the financial sector and these like reallocation of the bank's assets. Okay, some assumptions. Of course, there's a segmented financial market that leads to deviations from UIP. Uh, perhaps more related to sterilization is that I assume that banks are, to some extent, forced to hold these sterilized bonds. Uh, you can think of this as a reserve requirement, or if you, if you believe there's enough demand for domestic debt, you might say that this demand is fully satisfied by any changes in the government's choice to have sterilized bonds. Um, so that's perhaps more related to sterilization. And I just assume U.S. households are more patient, so they have an incentive to invest in the emerging market. All right. Um, I'll skip over to the simulations and results. So I'll focus on like a one-time shock to the U.S. monetary policy. I'll consider the case of monetary tightening, which is perhaps more related to um, the world today. And I'll compare a model with and without the sterilization. So in not just a sterilization, but just FXI. So we'll have one model with no sterilization and another model with the full effect of the sterilized FXI. Okay. So that's what I show you here. I have a 1% annualized increase in federal funds rate. And the orange line is going to be the model without the intervention, and the blue line is going to be the model with the intervention. Um, and the first row here is going to depict the emerging market variables, consumption, investment, and output. And the second row is the corresponding variables for the US. Okay? And then at the bottom, I just go over like net exports and perhaps most importantly, the real exchange rate where an increase means a home depreciation, so an emerging market depreciation. Uh, maybe a few things to note first is the US economy is more contractionary with the sterilized intervention. And this is gonna be related to kind of the welfare losses that I was referring to before. Uh, we see a global shrinking of like, global investment. Perhaps this is coming from just the fact that sterilization affects the bank's ability to give loans to capital producers. So in that sense, the, invest, like, the market for investment is more vulnerable or fragile if there is this amount of sterilization. Okay? And well, with intervention, net exports are going to be a bit more um, vulnerable on the long end of the results. Uh, and this comes in from just the change in the real exchange rate behavior. Um, so upon impact, I think the most imp interesting variable on this slide is the real exchange rate. So let's talk about that. Um, so upon impact, we see a higher increase on the real exchange rate. So this is saying that with sterilization, the real exchange rate is more, more vulnerable to U.S. shocks. And why is that, right? So if we go back to kind of the model and we had this variable YT, right? So we're changing the amount of sterilization and that directly affects the UIP premium. But this is a model where we already have sterilization and there's a change in sterilization that brings us closer to a world, say, with no sterilization. So in that sense, the UIP premium is more vulnerable upon impact. Okay? And perhaps better for emerging market policymakers is that after, say, quarter four, we're seeing a much lower um, levels of the real exchange rate, meaning that emerging markets appreciate much faster and to a much lower level. Um, this is all deviations from steady state, but in the sense of the steady state results of the model, I also observe that there, the emerging market has a higher appreciation or a higher level of the exchange rate in steady state compared to a model without. And so let's move on to the financial sector and see what this looks like. So in the first two boxes, of course, we're seeing nothing for the orange line because there's no intervention. Uh, but upon impact, of course, the central bank is trying to sell dollar reserves and trying to offset the emerging market depreciation. And at the same time, issuing you know, or retracting back sterilized bonds from the market and trying to control the monetary supply. Okay, And I plot the two kinds of spread it, credit spread and the UIP spread we have in the model. And we see that both are more vulnerable upon impact to a US shock. 
So in some sense, perhaps this explains why um, we're a bit wary of FXI because it might make emerging markets more sensitive. And the only difference between the credit spread and the UIP spread is after quarter four, we're seeing a much lower levels of UIP spread. So in that sense, the emerging markets central bank is a bit efficient on reducing the UIP spread. But of course, after quarter four. Uh, and where does this come from? So this is hard to tell exactly in general equilibrium, right? But it's very much related to the behavior of the real exchange rate. And why is that? It's because it's coming through play in this ratio X, which was foreign debt to total assets. Because foreign debt, when we think about it for the perspective of the emerging market bank, we're thinking about like, that in terms of local currency. So whatever foreign deposits, dollar deposits they had from overseas times the exchange rate. So the behavior of the exchange rate really changes the response of the foreign debt. And that turns out to be very important for how risky these banks are. So sterilization in this way can make the financial sector in emerging markets less risky by changing the allocation or the composition of assets that the bank holds. All right. um, so of course this is in terms of having a one-time policy shock and it is hard to tell some of the welfare implications for this kind of model. So next I try to have the full scale of the stochastic model and try to think of what happens if we have the random process of, say, the monetary policy shock and what, does ha what happens to welfare. So with that in mind, I use the household utility function to describe welfare. And in that sense, it's fairly standard. And I compare the welfare losses um, for the emerging market versus the US. And I find that there's much more welfare improvement or less welfare losses for emerging markets when there is this kind of intervention. And of course, it's not the size is not the same, but there are some welfare losses for the United States. So in this sense, you might say, oh, maybe perhaps this is some of the motivation to justify this kind of intervention. All right. Um, with that, I'll conclude a few of the next steps, one of which is, of course, I want to include dominant currency pricing and have export be, exports be sticky and the US dollar um, to turn off this expenditure, expenditure switching channel and see how the model changes. And the main direction of that is, of course, coming from the behavior of net exports. So perhaps when we take into account um, the changes in the behavior of net exports because of dominant currency pricing, perhaps some of these responses of um, the real exchange rate might be a bit more amplified and the benefit for a sterilized intervention might be stronger. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me to come here and give some comments and suggestions for Sarah's paper. Um, what this paper does basically is look at the, uh, the effectiveness of sterilized uh, foreign exchange integration for exchange uh, emerging market economies. Um, the paper is uh, asymmetric to country uh, open economy model. And uh, the definition or what exactly the paper referred to uh, the effectiveness of this intervention at the moment uh, has been the cycle and also welfare and the paper obviously is a working process. Um, the two elements uh, in this uh, in this study would be the uh, sterilized uh, intervention and also the most important well interesting feature of the model here would be the imperfect financial market in the home economy which uh, you have the endogenous UIP deviation 
Contribution-wise, we can see uh, try to close the gap between exchange rate intervention and the economic theory. I'm going to get to here uh, in the next slides, and also look at uh, foreign monetary policy shock on, on emerging market economies. Obviously, the most significant contribution here is the first one. Um, as in this workshop or conference, we, we've been uh, talked about uh, many times already. Uh, if you look at uh, theory, we want to look at the exchange rate monetary policy and capital flows. Obviously, this paper is not related to capital flows. Um, On the other hand, if you look at the nature of the shocks in question, which is obviously uh, the foreign uh, monetary policy shock, which is nominal, so uh, based on theory, I think uh, the theory suggests that you, you could be able to implement some exchange rate intervention from that perspective. Um, as uh, Sarah just mentioned, uh, uh, there's one paper, uh, um, a lot of countries um, being investigated and showed the evidence of exchange rate intervention in the emerging markets. Uh, what I try to point out here is that if you look at what in the past, in the 1997 Asian currency crisis and later on uh, the, the crisis happened in Argentina, um, we would want to ask uh, a question whether, uh, from that point of view, whether um, exchange rate iteration is, is ideal or optimal for policymakers. Uh, that is, I feel like, uh, uh, the author can discuss a little bit in the paper. Um, to motivate the study, uh, the paper shows uh, the negative uh, or inverse correlation between foreign reserves and, and the domestic CPI in emerging market economies. Um, by foreign exchange intervention, then you saw, you saw uh, US dollar reserves. In other words, your foreign reserve goes down and then uh, your domestic money supply will, will decrease and then if we look at it, the money supply and inflation, so there will be a positive correlation between money supply and uh, sorry, money growth and, and inflation. So I'm not sure this inverse correlation observed from the data um, also holds uh, according to the theory. And uh, the more important question we would like to ask is there a causality between these, these two. And uh, on, on another point would be this correlation is, is above point half, point 0.5. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a little bit oversell to see highly correlated. It's something you want to clarify a little bit. Um, the main findings. Um, she just presented to us. Uh, I just want to point out uh, when it comes to consumption equivalent uh, um, welfare, uh, if you look at the literature, Lucas 1987, uh, the formula would be given showing these slides, whereas you use the, the one that I showed in here as well. I would suggest you to go have a look. Um, otherwise, other main findings I understand is, is, is this paper is working in process and uh, some of the works I think still need to be done and to, to support your, your concurrent. Um, in terms of the, the business cycle, the, 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 the impact of sterilization on business cycle fluctuations, you conclude that uh, the intervention uh, reduce the volatilities of auto gap inflation and rate exchange rate. So, I'm not sure what based on what uh, what comparison analysis that you draw this concurrent. Um, um, 
the main finding would be there will be no significant impact on CPI. Um, later on, I will, I will come back to this. I was thinking, what what is the, the reason for this? And then I will give you some suggestions. Um, the benefit of exchange rate intervention comes at the cost of uh, declining net exports, and uh, and uh, we would also like to ask, you know, why this is the case, because if you have the sterilization, then your domestic currency won't depreciate. Is that your argument? Right, so um, then I'm not sure if this, we can refer to this as a cost. Spillback effects on US CPI inflation and negative welfare effects for the US. Um, that I think we have to look a little bit uh, more into this, uh, why this is the case. The conventional view would be, I think, the update. Um, you would not want to expect uh, anything comes from a small economy have a significant impact on, on the U.S. economy. So, um, I'm going to skip this um, due to the time limit. You've already pre presented. I just want to uh, give some comments on, on, on the model part and uh, Understand the incomplete financial market in the home economy is crucial to derive this uh, UIP deviation endogenously. I'm not sure if we can have a simple model with all the banks and then can achieve the same, like uh, in, employ the so-called imperfect substitution of domestic foreign assets, like the portfolio share you have in, in your current uh, model. And uh, Sterilization, uh, the two equations basically define the equilibrium uh, sterilized for, uh, domestic debt, sorry, which is SB, and also the US reserve. Um, the bigger question I want to ask is that uh, besides this, what is the linkage between, you know, um, the sterilized uh, domestic debt to to the rest of the economy, especially the real side, and also uh, this also applies to the foreign reserve, and uh, and also if if you think about it, uh, only those big emerging market economies like China has, has sufficient foreign reserves that can start implementing this kind of uh, intervention, right? Otherwise, all the small economies. I'm not sure it's a good idea for these SOEs to, to, to implement this kind of policy. And in the model, is there a limit? And also, what's the linkage between the, uh, the foreign reserve and, and the rest of the model, especially on the rail side as well? Um, another point I want to make is in your, in your foreign reserve, including the policy reaction, including you have the nominal exchange rate. Whereas in, in your sterilization equation, you have the real exchange rate. So I'm not sure why this is the case. Uh, some minor comments uh, for you to consider. You have domestic deposits, uh, deposits in domestic currency. You have government bonding in domestic currency. Then you have sterilized uh, uh, bonding in, in domestic currency. So obviously the return to all of these three uh, financial variables are all the same. I'm not sure this is necessary. Um, the second point, real exchange rate, uh, uh, I guess the, there's a typo here. Um, it's nominal exchange rate is missing. Um, I have a question about the, the notation that you set up with this equations, uh, the budget constraints, uh, um, in the way that, for instance, in, in this household budget constraint, on the right-hand side, you have R, the return to deposits actually is, is real, right? Then the RN, return to government bond, is nominal. 
which is your policy rate, if I can recall. Then the way you write up this equation, the inflation is, is disappears, right? So uh, I'm not sure there's one reason why you don't have a significant impact on, on CPI. Um, another question, obviously, why you have, you, you define the way that you have both real and nominal interest rates in this, this budget constraint. Um, and also you want to look into the home and foreign economic setup. You have uh, H for home, F for foreign, they have a star for foreign, and nothing, no superscript for, for home. Uh, you would want to look into this. And timing for interest rate, as uh, for instance here, uh, this is pretty, uh, sorry, this is a, a, a state dependent uh, return for deposits, whereas here, you know, it's, it's not. Even for the same uh, interest rate RN in, in, in the in banks budget constraint, I think is all the timing also is different. Uh, you want to have a look at that. Um, I hope uh, uh, all of them make sense, or at least some of them make sense to, and uh, and helps. Thank you. Do you want to reply first, and then we take questions? Thank you for your comments. Um, I'm not sure if I can address all of them at the moment. Um, I think maybe I can start. Well, thank you for pointing out to me the different measures of welfare. So I can definitely try around with that and see if the results are different. Uh, in the sense of net export, it's not like necessarily the case that I see it as a like negative effect of the model, but it's just something that emerging markets do care about. So in terms of that response, that's something that they might care about, especially if they're very export oriented. Um, but in terms of the differences, we can go back to the results. I think it really comes from the changes with the real exchange rate. So in that sense, with intervention, the emerging market is of a higher level, so that affects how competitive their exports are. So that's why I'm referring to them being different, and there might be some costs to the emerging market from that. But of course, in the welfare measure, or in terms of looking at you know, macroeconomic volatility, in that case, the positives outweigh the negatives. Uh, but it's just something to be wary of, is maybe what to take away from that. Um, but thank you for that clarification. And then in terms of spillback, I think this is, I think this is something to think about more, in the sense that we don't really think about spillbacks of FXI to other countries necessarily. So this is just trying to kind of measure if there is such a thing. Um, and where might it be coming from, of course? Um, the way I see it is I think it's coming from the UIP premium. So this is something that you know, advanced economies, or in this case the US, takes a premium from holding foreign assets. So if you're able to reduce that premium associated with their foreign investments, they can have some effect on their income and welfare. Um, so I would say that's something to investigate a bit more, I think, but from an initial like, look, that's where I'm thinking the spillback, like the negative spillback to the US might be coming from. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, I don't have a small open economy because I want to capture some of the spillback effect. So uh, in the sense of calibration, perhaps you can think of it as a block of emerging markets instead of a single emerging market, um, or as you mentioned, a large emerging market on the other side. Um, and then I'm not sure if I can address all of your comments. In the case of, I can go back to perhaps your slides. Um, in the case of the nominal and the real, I think this is important because you may think of a Taylor rule. In that case, um, like the nominal interest rate is set by the central bank in terms of like inflation. And here, I don't want to target a nominal variable through a real variable in terms of like determinancy of the model. So that's why, well, in terms of also the realistic case of how intervention comes into play, if you're an emerging market central bank, you don't observe the real exchange rate on the spot. So 
for you to be able to change your quantity of, say, foreign reserves, you need to be able to only respond to nominal exchange rates. So in terms of being a closer tie to reality, I think perhaps the nominal exchange rate is a better um, variable. And for the second equation, I just express everything in real terms, but we could easily rewrite it in terms of the nominal exchange rate, and instead of using the real exchange rate um, for the foreign and the home exchange rate, we could easily use the nominal. Um, so I think it's just a, maybe I can rewrite the notation in a way that makes more sense for that kind of perspective. Um, and then I think for your other questions, we can maybe talk later and yeah. Okay, thank you. Good job. Um, question and comment. So at the very beginning, um, in your you know, positives, neutrals, negatives, you listed stuff, but then you did not talk about or show all of those. In particular, um, you said that the impact on the inflation would be neutral. Yes. Um, and that was nowhere to be seen. But that's yes. kind of interesting, actually. Um, in particular, that the new Keynesian model actually ties output to inflation. So what is the mechanism in the model that generates an output response without a corresponding inflation response. Right. So that's the question. Um, and, and the other thing is, among your negatives was permanent lower reserves. Um, that to me is a nonsensical negative, right? Um, you know, what is the downside of spending reserves? You have rest reserves, duh. Um, that's not really a negative, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's not like it's creating an externality or causing something on its own, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd actually not list that as a, as a, as a negative. Thank you, Rafet. Um, so I agree. I don't have the inflation responses here for not to bombard you with uh, impulse responses. And given there was no change, I didn't include it in the results. Uh, but thank you for pointing it out. In terms of the mechanisms, I think the standard dynamics of the new Keynesian model are really strong enough that there is really not a response in terms of prices. Maybe in, in, case, in the case of if we had like dominant currency pricing, we might see a difference in terms of uh, like the producer price and if you want to augment the model in some way for like global value chains and dollar denominated imports we might have some like much more inflationary dynamics coming from the changes of the exchange rate so in that sense there might be more significant changes with intervention and the intervention really having an effect on the exchange rate um, in terms of foreign reserves yes I don't think this is a negative of the model because the welfare maximizing thing is the welfare maximizing thing. Um, I think having come from Turkey and like yourself, I think we are wary of the permanent fall in reserves and perhaps hitting a zero lower bound. So I include that there for that reason. But of course, if you want to look at it within the lens of the new Keynesian model, there's really no negative effect of that. Um, but if you're an emerging market policymaker, maybe you do see that as a negative in the real world. A uh, nice presentation. I wanted to ask, um, do you also have a comparison between sterilized and unsterilized intervention, also like what the implications for welfare are? Great question. Uh, so this is something I don't have at the moment, but I can talk a little bit about the, what the differences might be. Um, well, as I explained, the sterilization is really having a kick through this composition of assets in the banks. And that's how it plays out in the model in terms of the financial frictions. And if we didn't have the sterilization aspect, <clears throat> all we would have would be like coming from the balance of payments. So it would really affect the financial flows between countries and net exports. So it's unclear to me, and I think that would be a great thing to add, but my first guess is that the financial frictions are an amplifying factor, and in that way, I think the welfare losses would be maybe somewhere in between no intervention, unsterilized and sterilized. Um, but I really wanted to focus on the banking sector today, so that's why I don't have it. But thank you, I think it's a great point. Thank you. Um, look, I'm not an economist, right? <laughs> I'm a mathematician, but I uh, just would like to come from a different angle here. Um, when you started your presentation, you showed the banking balance sheet and where they fund themselves. And you spoke about raising funds from the domestic market and then from the foreign market. Now, in my experience, usually when banks start raising funding from the domestic market, which is uh, foreign currency, and then translating that into 
local currency to grow the asset or grow the balance sheet, it introduces some significant risk. Um, the risk that um, FX risk and interest rate risk and so forth. So those type of risks that the banks are then introducing in their balance sheet, how does that affect your overall modeling and the wealth at the end of the day? Thank yeah, you. Great question. So what you're, I think what you're describing is some sort of like currency mismatch over time. So the bank is overbearing the risk of any currency depreciation and having to pay back, say, the U.S. investor at a higher exchange rate and losing money in that process. So that's showing up in terms of like the bank's um, Bank's choices, so not in the balance sheet, uh, but that's just an identity, but really in the first order conditions of the bank. Um, and here, I mean, you can see in terms of the UIP premium that the bank is giving to foreign investors, the bank is taking into account the expected future exchange rate and their expectations of what that might look like. So here, in terms of like the, you can think of the ter two terms here as an augmented discount factor for the bank. So the bank is making a choice as if it was a household and how to allocate and what kind of interest rate, for example, to, like, to pick. But in this case, the interest rate is the UIP premium. So they're, in fact, internalizing this risk into, as to how much they're going to pay back and what kind of UIP premium that's going to lead to. Okay, any other question? So in terms of time, 